The book of the prophet Joel. It's a short collection of prophetic poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Joel is unique among the prophets for a few reasons. First of all, there's no explicit indication of when this book was written. It's most likely the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin, but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings, and his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedies of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme in the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophets saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here in chapters one and two, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter one is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time, the locusts are being sent against Israel. And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer. And then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts, but he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes, and Joel says, the day of the Lord, it's dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how? To rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your God. In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent. Because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoting here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts, and we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now, up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment, and that with the God of mercy, there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. 
So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God's spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they can truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord, when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess it, and about how all of that leads us to hope that God will one day defeat evil in our world, but also inside of us, and bring his healing presence to make all things new. And that's what the book of Joel is all about. Well, good morning, everybody. As you see, we are continuing our study in the book of Joel, and I wanted to bring us up to speed a little bit on what we're talking about here this morning. Joel is this book that really speaks to the idea of what it means to have your life totally disrupted or interrupted, and that's, in fact, what we're calling the series, Life Interrupted. Joel is a prophet writing in the Old Testament to the people of Israel, and they are feeling the effects of a locust plague, right? These grasshoppers have gone into swarm mode. They've become this swarm of locusts, and they, are, they have gone through the nation, and it has disrupted everything in the nation of Israel. We talked about this last week. The grief and the fear is tangible, what they are experiencing. Life has been absolutely interrupted. Joel is, is a book that's really instructive for us at these kind of moments in our own life. And, and we talked last Sunday about really three responses, three places that you should look in these life-interrupted moments. One is that you should look around. You should just realize that there are spiritual moments to be learned in these life-interrupted moments. This is a physical reality of a situation. It's destructive. It's difficult. But how do we take lessons that are not just physical lessons, but spiritual lessons from times like these? It, you know, the virus is, is disruptive for all of our lives. And, and Joel, the, the scale of what the prophet Joel was dealing with and then his nation at the time uh, was also very disruptive. We want to look within. There's a call to repentance in the book of Joel he calls people to look at their own lives, consider where they are in terms of their relationship with God. Um, there's Realize in these moments that God may be using moments like the one that we're all experiencing, as well as the one that the people of Israel were experiencing in the book of Joel. God may be using these moments to get our attention. So let's look within. Let's look at our own lives. Let's consider what do we want to leave behind what do we want to take with us out of moments where life is interrupted? And then we are told to look up. And Joel issues this proclamation to the people of Israel. And he says, call out to God. He calls for this nationwide time of prayer and fasting and mourning and turning to God and asking for God's help. And the question I left you with last week and the question I'll be leaving you with this week is how can you steward moments like this one? We are in this really interrupted, really unique time in our lives where our nation is taking this huge response to deal with the threat of this virus, and it's interrupting a lot of our lives. And so how do we steward those moments? 
we think of stewardship typically in terms of what do we do with the money God has given us to manage. If the money we have is all God's money, how do we manage it for Him? That's kind of this biblical idea of stewardship or looking at our time. God's given us a certain amount of time. How do we manage our time on behalf of God? But how do we manage a moment in time? This is a period in human history, a period in the you know, modern world that we have been given to manage. None of this took God by surprise. How do we handle moments like this well when our lives are interrupted? How can we steward this moment? So with that in mind, we're going to jump into Joel chapter 2. That's our kind of recap, and we're going to jump into Joel chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 17. We're looking at three themes that we'll see from Joel chapter 2, and we'll get to those in a few moments. Joel 2 starts out like this. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will again, nor will be again after them, through the years of all generations." Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them is a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap upon the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall, they march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another, each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? So we're going to stop right there. We'll go through the whole chapter of Joel chapter 2 during the course of this message, but we're going to stop right there for just a moment. And I want to let you know about what's happening in Joel 2. So this is you see all this imagery of an army that is marching, but then the army's marching up the walls, and there are really differences in interpretation about what specifically is being mentioned in this passage. Perhaps this is another poetic way of describing this locust swarm that has caused such devastation in Israel. Maybe they're talking about some future army that, that God is going to use to judge the nation of Israel if they don't turn away from their sins. It's a little unclear what specifically is happening in Joel chapter 2. In fact, in the video we just watched, you see an explanation of what that could be, what this army in Joel 2 is. But there, there's a little bit of a difference of opinion and some difference of interpretation. And it's not super important that we know exactly what is being talked about here because one theme that is very clear is the first theme in, in Joel chapter 2, which is this one, the day of the Lord. We see that mentioned several times in Joel 2, and it's actually a very important concept in the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. What do we need to understand about this phrase, the day of the Lord, and what it means? Well, let's talk about what it means for a moment here. One of the things that, that one of the ways that phrase is used in Scripture is to describe an intervention where God works 
in, he, he intervenes in human history. He breaks through into world events, and he judges his enemies, and he delivers his people. And so some examples of this in the Bible are Passover. In the story of Exodus, where God delivers Israel out of slavery to Egypt, there's this Passover story, and that's an example of the day of the Lord, or any time that God judges his enemies and delivers his people. But usually when this phrase is used, it is talking about a future day of the Lord where God breaks into human history, and, and the author of the play walks onto the stage, and the show is over, as C.S. Lewis says. This is a future point where the world's, and the world's events have been clicking along through all of history, and then at one point, God breaks in and it stops. It's the end of the world. It's the day of the Lord. This is where God puts a stop once and for all to all injustice, to all sin, and he comes as the righteous judge. In chapter 3, the, the chapter after, oddly enough, after chapter 2, comes chapter 3. Um, there's this description of God gathering all the people at something called the Valley of Decision. And there's this word Jehoshaphat, which means the Lord is judge. And he assembles everybody and, and passes judgment on, on the world. And it's this, it's this time of, it's, it's the end, it's the day of the Lord. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in church, and I grew up going to church, and for me, that concept of the day of the Lord was something that scared me. It was something that terrified me. It was something that made me nervous. And, and here's what I want us to understand when we think about that, because so far, you're probably feeling about the same way. The day of the Lord, that doesn't sound very pleasant. If you're feeling that way, perhaps we're not, we don't have a clear enough picture in our mind of who God is. And a lot of Joel is about that. A lot of Joel is about the character of of God. And, and we know as Christians reading the book of Joel, we can put a whole, we, can, we read Jesus here. We see Jesus being the one who takes upon himself the wrath of God's judgment so that we don't have to face it. It doesn't have to be a terrifying thing for anybody who would put their faith in Jesus. And here's a question that we need to think about when we're thinking about moments like this, the day of the Lord, a future day where God will come as judge and deliverer of his people, that, one, that history will end at some point, that God will arrive in a way that is noticeable by all people and bring in this new reign where he comes as king and he comes as righteous God. But there's this aspect as well that he comes as judge in this moment. And the question we need to deal with is this one. Can a loving God, can a God who is described as love, God is love, can a loving God be a God who passes judgment? Is that, can those two concepts live together? And I want to say, if you understand what love is, he has to also be a God who passes judgment. Because I don't know if you noticed, but the world can be pretty messed up sometimes. Right? And you have this instinct where when you see justice happen, when you see a terrorist who has been terrorizing the world finally get some Navy SEALs breaking into a compound and stopping this reign of terror, something in you rejoices. Right? Something in you that is excited when justice happens. You see someone powerful, some wealthy, powerful person who has been victimizing people for decades, and they go down, and the media is covering it. There's a part of you that rejoices. You want to see injustice corrected. We all do. And in fact, on a very personal level, if you've experienced injustice, someone hurt you, someone did something wrong against you, and justice was never brought about, you want a God who brings justice as a part of him being loving. God is loving, and part of him being loving is he has to destroy the evil and pass justice on, on, on the injustices that we see all around us. You know, one question that I think some people are asking about this whole virus thing that we're going through, and a question that people definitely were thinking of about the locust plague was, is this God's judgment? Like, is this God judging people, this coming about? And we know from the book of Joel that that locust plague was, in fact, God's judgment. It was God trying to get the attention of the people of Israel, call them back to himself, and it was a loving act 
It was God actually waking them up and helping them to know that. Now, about this virus, can we say that? Can I say that this morning, that this is God's judgment upon our nation or upon our world? I think that'd be very irresponsible for me to say this is God's judgment. I don't know that. That's not, I'm not in the place of God. I am not an Old Testament prophet that could say that on God's behalf. That's a God thing to deal with. Um, we know that this world is broken. Creation itself is experiencing the brokenness of this world, and viruses are a part of, a part of creation itself experiencing the brokenness of sin. That's just the reality of the world that we live in until this day where God comes to fix everything once and for all. We do know that God can bring difficulties in our life as a loving act of discipline for his children. That in fact, if, if we're going astray and, and being led off course somewhere, one of the ways that God shows his love for us is sometimes sending difficulties our way. It's a part of a loving act of our Father who is trying to correct us and trying to get our attention. That being said, I don't know that about the virus. And I think it would be irresponsible for me to say, yes, this is God's judgment. I, I don't know that, and I don't think it's helpful for Christians to make pronouncements like that. And so I'm certainly not going to make a pronouncement about that. We do know that God uses difficult situations to prompt soul searching. We are experiencing this life interrupted moment and one of the responsible things that we should do, one of the ways that we can steward these difficult moments is to look within like we talked about last week. Is there something in our lives where God wants to get our attention and wants us to be a little bit more introspective than we normally are? within this environment we find ourselves in, in this life-interrupted moment. Eugene Peterson, in his introduction to the book of Joel, Pam was just mentioning Eugene Peterson a few minutes ago, he, he, the introduction that he wrote to the book of Joel in the message translation he starts like this. He says, when disaster strikes, understanding of God is at risk. Unexpected illness or death, national catastrophe, social disruption, personal loss, plague or academic, dev epidemic, devastation by flood or drought, turn men and women who haven't given God a thought in years into instant theologians. Rumors fly. God is absent. God is angry. God isn't playing favorites, or God is playing favorites, and I'm not the favorite. God is ineffectual, God is holding a grudge from a long time ago, and now we're paying for it. It's the task of the prophet to stand up at such moments of catastrophe and clarify who God is and how he acts. If the prophet is good, that is accurate and true, the disaster becomes a lever for prying people's lives loose from their sins and setting them free for God. Joel is one of the good ones. He used a current event in Israel as a text to call his people to an immediate awareness that there wasn't a day that went by that they weren't dealing with God. We are always dealing with God. There is a sense in which catastrophe doesn't introduce anything new into our lives. It simply exposes the moral or spiritual reality that already exists but was hidden beneath the overlay of routine, self-preoccupation, and busyness. In difficulty, in these moments, our perception of our lives and our perception of who God is, is called into question. We take a look at what God is all about and how do we relate to an eternal God. There's two main questions that comes up too when you're, when you're thinking about God and these examples that he gave in the introduction to Joel that I just read to you. There's two kind of big questions there. Is God good and is God powerful? And both of those things really come up into question. If God is good, why is he allowing difficult things to happen? Maybe it's because he's not powerful enough. Or, yeah, maybe God is all-powerful, but maybe he's not good, and that's why he's not putting a stop to something. Those two fundamental realities of our perception of God are vitally important, and they go hand in hand. God is good. God is powerful. And Joel really builds the case for how good God is and how powerful he is. And we'll read in the rest of Joel chapter 2 some of what he talks about. God is absolutely good and he is absolutely powerful. Both of those things are true. The original lie from the enemy from the Garden of Eden is that God is either not good or he's not all-powerful. He's holding back something. The Christian message is 
that God is good, He is all-powerful, and because of who He is, and because of how we can be in relationship with Him, the day of the Lord is not a fearful thing at all. It is a day of blessing, it is a day of hope. In fact, it's what the New Testament calls our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Savior Jesus. That's our blessed hope. So we're going to read the rest of Joel chapter 2, and then there's going to be two more themes that we'll deal with um, for the rest of the chapter here. We're going to talk about the character of God, and we're going to talk about the God who is with us. So let's finish Joel chapter 2. We're in verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain. The early and the latter rain is before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now, I want you to notice about this passage the character of God. This is in, in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2 that we started the sermon with. We saw that God is powerful. We saw that God has great power. But then as we continue to read on, we see that God is gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. He wants to, for his people, bring blessing. He wants, he's the God who satisfies us. He's the God who rescues us. He's the God who does great things. God provides for his people. He deals wonderfully with his people. He removes shame. And he's a God who brings restoration. So this prophes, prof, prophecy and promise for the people of Joel was that the day of the Lord, you know, this, this kind of great day that should call people to turn towards God and examine their own hearts and, and be in proper relationship with God. His promise for the people of Joel was that he would restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And if we understand the significance of what they're going through, this, the crops have been destroyed, there's potentially years of trouble ahead because the seed was eaten as well in addition. So now they don't have seed to plant for the next year. And what are they going to do? God promises that for his people, he brings restoration. He brings hope. He's going to help them. He's not leaving them. He's not abandoning them. He's going to restore for his people the years that the locust has eaten. And then at the end of chapter 2, the final theme we'll talk about this morning is that he is the God who is with us. The God who is with us. And we see that later in chapter 3 as well. And we're not going to cover chapter 3 as a part of this series. But if you continue to read, you'll see those two themes, the day of the Lord and the God who is with us, kind of both of those themes together in chapter 3. 
God pours out his spirit, part of the promise here in Acts chapter 2. And in fact, this is a very important verse in the New Testament. It's something that's quoted when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost. The church is a brand new thing. Jesus has invented this thing called the church. He's poured out his Holy Spirit on his people. Peter stands up and there's all these people, thousands of people waiting to hear the message of Jesus. And Peter says to them, because God has poured out the Holy Spirit on people in such an unmistakable way. He says, this is what the prophet Joel talked about. You can read this in Acts chapter 2. Peter says, this is what we're talking about. God's spirit, where he used to be just at helping specific people in specific situations, now God's spirit has been through Jesus Christ poured out on all people. This new day has come. In fact, for you and I in, in this time in human history, we get to live in this time that Joel longed for. Joel was, he wished he had what we get to experience. That even though we can't be together in person, we have the Holy Spirit uniting us and teaching us and drawing people near. And we get to live in this life, this day, this new day has come that Joel was longing for and hoping for. He says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, this is verse 32 of chapter 2, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When we read Old Testament passages like this, it's, it can be tricky, right? And that's one of the, my goals for these two weeks was for you to think about these kind of passages. When you come across them, if you're doing a Bible reading plan and you get to the book of Joel and you go, how do I read these things as a Christian? We need to realize that, that some of this is, is calling forward to, toward, towards things that Jesus will do someday, like the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. This was fulfilled because of what Jesus did for us. But also that when we read passages like this as Christians, we need to realize that Jesus took God's judgment upon himself so that we didn't have to, so that we could be those people who call upon the name of the Lord and receive the salvation that he freely offers us. You know, our faith is the only belief system in the world that believes our God came down and experienced the pain and suffering firsthand. Our God can relate to any difficulties you might be going through right now. Our God knows what it's like to go through difficult situations. Jesus came down and lived amongst us and paid the penalty for our sins. I wanted to read a quote from the ESV Gospel Transformation Bible. It says, not only on the final day of history, but also on the final day of Christ's earthly ministry, the sun and the sky were darkened. We read about that in the Gospels. He died in the middle of history amid darkened skies so that we can know that our own personal darkened skies are not meant to punish us. Jesus paid for our sins. Jesus offers us new life and offers us redemption. And if you're a follower of Christ this morning, we get to rejoice and thank God for his amazing gift on our behalf. We get to live in what Joel only wished he could have. But I also want us to think about, again, how do we steward moments like this? We realize that, that our God is good. We think about his plan for history. We want to be properly related to him. We want to have him and follow him as our savior. We want other people to know who he is as well. We know that our God is not limited, that he's, he dwells among us and we benefit from that amazing fact. But how do we steward these life-interrupted moments. I want to end with something for you to think about. In 1940, September 1940, the Nazi Air Force began a bombing campaign over the city of London called the Blitz. I've got a couple pictures I want to show you. I've got a picture of a bomber that's going on a bombing raid going over the city of London. And it wreaked havoc, absolute devastation for a period of eight months where the people of London were just under the constant threat of their houses being blown up. If you know from history, the kids were sent off to live with people in the country during this time. And 60% of all of the homes in the city, 2 million homes, were destroyed by German bombs. People built bunkers in their backyard to try to find safety. They would stay in the tubes to find shelter down there in the tubes at, uh, in the subway system. 
And one day, a bomb fell very, very close to Westminster Cathedral. I think we have a picture of Westminster Cathedral for you to take a look at. Westminster Cathedral, beautiful city, beautiful, uh, beautiful church, I mean, in the city of London, and it's this incredible uh, church, and it, a bomb fell very, very close, and thankfully, because of the bad aim or whatever of the bomber, it just made a big crater next to the church rather than destroying the church. At this period of time where 40,000 civilians were killed, this was a completely interrupting moment. This crater almost hits this church. And the crater stayed there for a few months until they had an idea. And the idea was this. They're trying to find green space, places where they can plant gardens. They were facing food shortages because of the war that was happening. And so they're trying to put gardens everywhere. And so they're you know, soccer fields are being taken over so they can grow food. And they look at this crater and they go, this crater next to a church would make a really good garden. And so that's exactly what they did. They planted a garden in the middle of this crater created by a bomb during one of the most intense bombing campaigns in history. And I want you to take a look at the picture of the crater garden in the middle of this bombing campaign. We've got a couple of pictures of, of what that looked like. This was a period, thinking of, thinking of life-interrupted moments. Man, I am so thankful that we're dealing with a virus and not a bombing campaign during World War II. I mean, these kinds of things put things into perspective. 40,000 civilians were killed, 60% of the city destroyed by German bombs. But I love the image of a garden in the middle of a bomb crater as a symbol of what God can do and as a symbol of our response in times of difficulty. How will we steward this moment in history? We are being presented with difficult scenarios, difficult situations, but I believe that God wants to do something good through this. God wants us to be related to him properly. We think about the fact moments like this make us introspective. Moments like this make us, make us think of what really matters and who God is. And so we need to resolve that question in our own hearts that God is good, God is powerful, God knows what we're going through. God wants to have a relationship with us. God wants every one of you watching this video to have a relationship with him. Jesus made that possible. Jesus died on the cross for us so that we might have life through him. Scripture tells us we put our faith in Jesus and we receive the gift of salvation that he so freely offers. And that's available for everyone. But we also want to look, how do we represent God during moments like this? How, what are the gardens we can plant in the middle of the bomb craters? How can we serve the people around us? How can we build a life that sustains us and that strengthens the people around us, that offers help to people around us that needs that need help during these moments as well. I want to pray, and I just I hope you'll be thinking about this together as we pray. So would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for moments like this moment in time, and we, we do say thank you. Even though it's hard to um, accept difficult situations like a locust plague or like a war or like this virus that we're dealing with, we do know that you are not caught by surprise. We do know that you are good. We do know that you know exactly what we need during this time. And so, Lord, we want to open our hearts to you and say, do what you want to do in my life and in the lives of everybody watching right now. Lord, help us to know how to follow you. Help us to help other people come into a relationship with you. Lord, as our life is interrupted, may we steward this moment well. May we recognize the fact that one day you will return and you will reset, you will fix things, you will bring justice, you will bring deliverance. And for your followers, that is a moment of sheer hope and joy. It's our blessed hope. But Lord, there are people who need to know you personally, who are not yet your followers. And we want to be people that help spread the message about who you are and who you want to be in people's lives. So, Lord, may we be faithful. May we steward this moment well. I believe that people are more open to talking about faith than ever before in my life because of this virus. People want to have those conversations. 
people want to know about why we have hope when other people are feeling hopeless. And so, Lord, may we plant the gardens and the bomb craters of this world and to know how, how we can be related to you in such a way and knowing you so well, knowing that you are among us, knowing that you want to help us in this moment. Please help us to represent you well. Help us to help other people know you and help us to look for ways to serve the people around us. May we be people who provide hope. May we be people who tell others, hey, this is where hope is found. We thank you that you are gracious, you are good, you are merciful. We thank you for this time of being together. It's in Jesus' name we pray.